Well, hello again, and welcome to Coming Home Network Presents, where we have conversations about the kinds of questions that people wrestle with when they're exploring the Catholic Church and wondering if they should become a part of it. I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network, and if you're someone dealing with issues like this today, or actually uh, today it's not so much dealing with issues, if you're someone who has memories that intersect uh, with the world that we're discussing today, uh, and just want to talk to somebody and even rem- reminisce about them, then please do get in touch with us at the Coming Home Network. chnetwork.org is where you can find us. Uh, if you're looking for an online community full of people um, who are asking questions and exchanging uh, experiences about their Catholic journeys, then go to community.chnetwork.org. And of course, if you want to support our work so we can t- continue to facilitate conversations like these, then you can find out how to be a one-time or monthly donor at chnetwork.org slash donate. I am very thrilled to have today's guest on today's topic. I know I say that every time, but this is going to be so much fun because when I booked Father Randy Sly to come tape an episode of The Journey Home, we got to talking and did not realize that we have some incredible right. common experiences specifically related to Wilmore, Kentucky and the Ichthus Christian Music Festival. So, Father Randy Sly, thank you for accepting the invitation to share more of your backstory. Oh, it's my joy. I, I'm really looking forward to this, just kind of reminiscing about a very unique time in, uh, I think, uh, in history, really, in history. I mean, that's how we talked about it uh, on the last episode I did with some guys who were involved in the 90s Christian music underground and and alternative rock and hardcore and punk music. Uh, We're talking today, though, about 1970s Christian music, Jesus music, um, that whole world. Uh, People don't realize, as you were saying, that it it was this cultural phenomenon that really shaped how evangelicalism came to understand itself as a movement, Mm -hmm. as a form of Christianity. So um, I wanted to get into various questions about this, but the first question that I asked the last group of guys was, what qualifies you to speak on this particular uh, topic, Father? Because you have some street cred, I feel like, as far as this goes. I think I have a lot of different uh, things that I could share that kind of go to why I I really love speaking about this. It starts with white hair. Uh, I mean, this is my generation we're talking about. When we talk about Jesus people, I was one. And in fact, uh, that is a part of my uh, really coming into a live and dynamic faith in the Lord. Uh, as, as I shared on the journey home story, this was back when I was in my early twenties. I was a rock and roll DJ on the radio, uh, playing the hits for the kids and, uh, ended up, uh, joining the Navy during Vietnam. And it was in Vietnam that I really had an encounter with the Lord one weekend. Uh, when I was stationed, this was after Vietnam, I was stationed in uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I was down on Waikiki Beach, and there was a group there playing songs. And I love music, of course, so I was listening to the music. And I realized it was the kind of music that I like to play on the radio, but it wasn't about losing a girl or uh, a hot rod or surfing. It was about Jesus. And it just drew me in. I, I just stopped where I was going, and I just sat down under a palm tree and listened to the music. And it was just drawing me in. And after the the concert, and actually it was kind of more like a beach service, there was somebody that preached a message and everything. And a couple of the members of the group came over and uh, talked with me and began to share with me what they were doing, that they were there talking about Jesus with people on the, uh, the beach. That was kind of a summer mission thing from their church there, from uh, Van Nuys Baptist Church, First Baptist Church of Van Nuys, California. And uh, they were there as the youth group. And it was just an amazing time. We began to talk, and they were telling me about Jesus, and I was telling them about growing up in the Episcopal Church. And they talked more about Jesus. I talked more about the church. And we ended up where I realized they were talking about the occupant while I was talking about the building. So this was my, uh, I guess my initiation into, uh, contemporary Christian music as we called it at the time. And I didn't even know that's what it was. All I knew is that I was identifying with whatever this group was about. And in fact, they kind of took me under their wing and I went with them on their concerts and just shared my testimony with people in the crowd is, 
as they were sharing uh, the music. And so uh, I got out of the Navy, uh, came back, went back into radio. And all of that time, I then got involved in a church. I, In fact, I interviewed this youth group on the radio, that I, the station I was working for. Uh, we did a documentary every week. And I interviewed uh, them on what is uh, the Jesus movement doing. I'd learned that that's what it was called. What's the Jesus movement doing in Battle Creek? And they were talking about going down to the inner city and ministering to uh, street people, ministering to motorcycle gangs, handing out what they call the truth paper, all of these things. They had a hotline that kids could call in to know more about Jesus. Uh, all of these things were going on. And I found myself just swept into this, this whole world that, uh, that was Jesus centered. And it was not just the church. It was beyond the church. There were groups all over the city that were meeting for Bible studies. There were uh, music groups that were established at the local church that I became a part of during that time. I left the Episcopal church to become a part of the church where this youth group was meeting. And the pastor let us take the sound system out of the church, put it out on the front lawn, set up platforms and have, uh, music playing, testimonies, and just broadcasting it to the whole area. And we called them Jesus Grassers. So uh, this was something that we were involved in very deeply. And, uh, of course, this was the time that groups like Andre Crouch were beginning just to take root. Uh, you had uh, groups like Love Song, uh, Honey Tree, all of these. There's Andre. I don't Crouch know if you right see there. this, but I've got my Andre Crouch vinyl yeah. on the back of the shelf behind me. Yes, uh, I've got some others. While you're dropping names, by the way, I've, I've got some others from the vinyl. You can't see off to the side. Well, actually, I'll get to him last. Um, I've also got here. Uh, so this is a little bit later in that era, but I got some seventy sevens on vinyl, micro sure. and seventy sevens. Uh huh. I've got uh, you. You would have to know this guy, Randy Stonehill. Oh, Randy Stonehill, Randy Stonehill, on Stonehill yeah. right there. Yeah, shut the door, keep out the door. Uh, and of course, and of, and of course, the one Catholic in the mix, uh, John Michael, John Michael yeah. Talbot. Yeah, uh, the Talbot brothers well. were is... really good together too, in what they did. Uh, and then uh, I've got one, uh, one on the back shelf is the, uh, and and you no doubt have some things to say about this. I'm going to actually ask more questions about this guy as we go on, uh, but I got Keith Green on vinyl, and it even still has the sticker. Uh, where this is one of the hallmarks of Keith's ministry, where it says, if you cannot afford the retail price of this recording, um, please write to the below address and we'll send you information on how to order a copy for whatever you can afford. Yeah. I mean, that kind of gives you the spirit of what this movement was about, like just reading that sticker on Keith Green's album. Well, that, in fact, became a, a huge, huge issue uh, in concerts and uh, festivals and things like that was the whole issue of contracts versus love uh stipends love gifts and uh it it really almost polarized that whole world uh when i was uh after uh college and working in radio when i went to seminary i continued working in radio and i even had a syndicated radio program called communicator uh that was on uh this network of about seven or eight stations uh, owned by the, uh, this uh, group out of uh, Lexington, Kentucky. And I also became involved in ICTHUS as uh, I was the PR director, and then I was the um, uh, program director and MC for a couple of years. Uh, and so that's where I met a lot of the people. I met Andre Crouch, of course, Pat Terry Group, uh, 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 the Archers, Andrus Blackwood and Company, Lamb. I mean, you could just go on and on and on. Uh, with these names, Daniel you Amos. You met Ken Medema, you met Jeremiah people, you met Living Sound, Good News Circle, Wonder Child, and Common Ground. Yep. You also met, uh, let's see, New Hope and Selah. You know how I know this is because in preparation for this, I went in and got my 1997 Ichthus yearbook out. And oh, it wow. goes through and it lists all the years and it lists the staff. And right here, I don't know if you can see, it says uh, for 1977, there's the poster, uh -huh. right? And there it says right there. Randy Sly, publicity. Yeah. Two pages Isn't later, it? says Randy Sly programs. Isn't that wild? Who knew? Yeah, those were, Who knew? Those were amazing, I've this thing amazing for days. Yeah. 25 years. Well, you know, uh, and one of my professors, Dr. Bob Lyon, was the one that actually started ICTHUS. And uh, 
Back in, you it, wouldn't even pick him or? out. Yeah, he was 19, yeah. I think, 73, 74. And he had this passion to reach young people uh, and was very unassuming, not in any way, shape, or form what you would look like uh, or look for in somebody that would start something like Ichthus. But, boy, it, it gained ground really, really fast. And I think my final year, I think we had 13,000 kids there for it. And I know it kept growing. We tried to keep it a little bit paced because it, that's just a lot of people to deal with. But uh, anyway, so th- yeah. but that whole era was amazing. And, of course, you had artists that uh, – one artist I remember sent me this huge contract. They were – uh, represented by a, a big talent agency out of Los Angeles. Then you had people, and I'd call them, and they'd say, whatever you want to give us is fine. And uh, th- so there was this very unique world that was uh, just a- wanting to share Jesus. That was the whole thing, just sharing Jesus. And it's very interesting because, you know, w- now that we're in the world of iTunes and Spotify, and, uh, you know, you can just go onto YouTube even and find – whatever song you want and actually whatever performances you want. I found an old, I was finding an old uh, Andre Crouch singing at Billy Graham crusade stuff. Uh, you just find it on YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. Back then, you know, we're before the era of CDs, <laughs> you know, so right. it's, um, it's hearing it on the radio. It's, it's hearing it in, in person and at concerts. Uh, so, I mean, all that's going on. Um, what's funny is that I would end up, uh, being with the Ichthus Festival when I was at Asbury College uh, in the late 1990s, uh, volunteered and actually worked um, some stuff on the media side when I was part of the communications pro- program at Asbury College. And we we're, I mean, you're talking like 25,000 people, uh, yeah. you know, when you're getting that festival going. Um, and I want to get into a little bit of how being part of that world shaped uh, shaped you to where you are today. But at the time, I wonder if you could talk about maybe like what kind of theologies were swirling in the mix? Because on one level, it's all about Jesus, right? Like that's kind of why it's so refreshing of a movement. In some ways, it's kind of like a third great awakening, <laughs> you know, right. yeah. when you look at the impact and the sweep of it. But when people are becoming Christians, first of all, how are they becoming Christians? Like what do they think they do to become a Christian? And then second of all, what kind of Christian are they becoming in terms of like what would be kind of like the theological markers of a person who— uh, I don't know, becomes a Christian at like a Keith Green concert or Andre, Andre mm-hmm. Crouch concert. Well, I think that the uh, late 60s, early 70s was a perfect storm. You had uh, uh, the 70s or the 60s uh, issue of uh, young people wanting a cause. And some of them caught on to Jesus being their cause, you know, uh, there's, you know, a lot of talking about uh, Jesus the revolutionary back then, for example. Um, denominations really didn't play a big part in that Jesus movement. Uh, everybody went to church, but a lot of times they went to different churches, but still came together over a commonality in Jesus. Um, there was uh, a, a lot of variation. You had some groups that might be a little bit more charismatic. Uh, other groups that may be a little more uh, just kind of laid back. Uh, some were acoustic. Some were more, you know, in your face, uh, uh, not heavy metal in any way, shape or form, but garage band style. And so you had all of these different things all swirling around at the same time. And at the same moment, you had um, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ really come to the fore and here, Bill Bright has a, given you, given us this formula in the little booklet, you know, the four spiritual laws. And uh, navigators had the bridge, and different groups had little booklets, and you found those booklets kind of being circulated a lot among groups, so that uh, I think that those four laws really kind of became, in many ways, shapes, and forms, the means through which individuals came into the church. You know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God wants to uh, redeem you, and all you need to do is to pray and, and repent and ask him to come into your life. Wham, bam, there you go. And I think that's really a part of what, what the Jesus movement was in in its essence. And then different churches, of course, would put different things on it. Um, I know that like the certain sounds in Hawaii when I was there, 
uh, as people would come to into relationship with Jesus, they would have baptismal services right out there on Waikiki Beach, and they would baptize them, and uh, that would be a part of their coming into the church as well. So there, you had a variety of 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 things going on, but it all involved that personal relationship, that that personal decision to follow Jesus. You ever meet any Catholics in that world? You know, if I did, I didn't know about it. I, I met some Lutherans and, of course, Episcopalians and others. Uh, now, we have to also remember, we're not too far away from, in 1977, the big charismatic uh, convention in Kansas City, where I live now, and that was mainly Catholic and other uh, uh, more liturgical groups, Lutherans and uh, Episcopalians and, and people like that, but all of them more the spirit-filled part of that group, and that kind of intermixed with it. So you had that going on. You had Bill Bright with Explo 72 uh, incorporating it. So there was a lot of movement, but uh, very, very little labeling going on in terms of who belongs to what. And uh, it was it was more about, again, the centrality of Jesus. I remember back not too long after that, Stuart Briscoe, who was a very prominent pastor in uh, Southern California at the time. No, was he or was he in Wisconsin? Anyway, he wrote an amazing book called Where Was the Church When the Youth Exploded? And it, it really documented the fact that in many ways, the church didn't know what to do with what was going on. Uh, Chuck Smith at and, Calvary uh, just Chapel. Just pause you there. Uh, yeah, Chuck Smith, by the way, who uh, who drove the the conversation that started all the bands that eventually I listened to as a kid. Like, for instance, the choir. I'm wearing my yeah. the choir shirt. The this right, was yeah. originally the youth choir. All those bands out of California. But you keep on saying this word that would have had a very kind of charged meaning in that world, and that is the church, right? Because, yeah. uh, you know, you and I are Catholics now, so we, when we say the church, we capitalize it. Um, there would have been people in that world who would have said coming into the church, and they would have not have meant a visible church. They would have meant this invisible body of Christ. But there probably would have been some people in that world who would have cringed at the very word church because right. they're not trying to introduce people to a church. They're introducing people to Jesus, much like this, this was kind of how you had that sort of talking past each other moment when that first thing happened on the beach in Waikiki. You're talking right. about you know, being part of the body of Christ and really, in your case, the building, whereas these people were like, clear it all out. We just want Jesus. And so that word church has a lot of charged meaning in these conversations. It it really did. And again, you heard uh, phrases back then like, uh, not religion, only a relationship. You know, we're not into the church, we're into Christ. And there there was... Uh, it. it I guess you could call it some animosity, but mostly it was a disinterest on the part of a lot of the young people at that time uh, toward what they would consider organized religion. But what happened is there were a number of churches that did, in fact, open themselves up to what was going on, like that church I belong to. I mean, the pastor saying, hey, yeah, rip out the sound system, take it out into the front lawn, you know, and play your music. Uh, and it was live music. This wasn't just playing records. It was live. And when you have a church like that, that is welcoming. Uh, Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, uh, was very welcoming to, you know, people. There were other churches that perhaps were not as open or understanding of, of what was going on. Uh, I know that there were some pockets of, uh, churches in the liturgical world, Episcopal, Lutheran, Catholic, some of them, you know, just kind of backed off and, uh, you know, they really, the music and, and the whole, uh, genre that was involved there and even kind of, as I would call it a subculture, uh, was hard to see integrating into the church. What's very interesting about this period of, of church music. So when you get into my world and, uh, even transitioning into the, the era that, you know, that I was playing music and playing in bands, um, there was much more of a, we're Christians, we're going to let our faith inform the way that we go about, you know, playing music. And, and it may not be like this evangelistic thing all the time. Sometimes it's just kind of, we're Christians, so we look at the world different, and that's just going to come out in the way we talk about just about anything. Whereas these groups, um, 
that you're talking about, there very much is like a, I mean, we're going to, we're going to make the sale at the end of this show. We're going to ask you where you stand with God. Uh, but in the middle of all that, uh, what's interesting about the world that you came from is it's producing people like, well, like Andre Crouch, I, we sang to God be the glory all the time in the churches I was in growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, various songs that, you know, came out of some of these groups were standards um, that we would hear at church on a Sunday morning. Whereas in my world, uh, there was never any illusion that when I was playing in metal bands that, you know, we should really introduce this on a Sunday morning. Like, in some senses, even though I was like a dyed-in-the-wool Protestant at that point, I was never under the impression that this should happen in church. It was always meant to be something that was kind of outside, out into the street, out out in the, like, a, what would you call it, a grasser, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, these are these are some big debates that are going on. My, I guess my question for, for you is, is, as you're watching some of these bands and, and you know, in your own spiritual formation and going to seminary when you're working for Ichthus, like, what are you thinking about, like, how does this fit with what I might one day be doing as a, as a pastor? I, I think that's a really valid question. And part of it has to do with the fact that uh, uh, contemporary Christian music at that point uh, had uh, I, I, this, this spectrum of, of what could be communicated in these songs. I don't know how to else to explain it. But some of it was pretty, uh, it didn't really have a lot of substance. You know, it, uh, it was kind of like, you know, Jesus is my snow tire, my snow tire. He helps me plow the way. And, but then you had a lot of groups that were beginning to move toward like scripture songs. So if you sing the Psalms, you're safe. And so that was going on. Uh, and then you had others that began to, really develop, I think, a more intentionality toward what they wanted to communicate with their music, that they realized it was more than just a beat and more than just uh, what a friend of mine would call happy clappy, but they wanting to take this, this genre of music and really communicate some essential, strong theological truth. And I, I saw that a lot uh, in, you know, of course, uh, Ken Miedema was really strong in wanting to accomplish that. Uh, and a number of others, some of whom were uh, more known than others. Uh, Lamb is another one that really wanted to bring the messianic message so that you could see the images of Jesus out of the feasts and festivals of the new, of the Old Testament and how that produced the new. And so they brought that haunting uh, messianic music uh, that was so beautiful. So there is a variety of, of content and a variety of styles, but I, I know that there's a lot of talking about content and what, what these uh, songs needed to communicate. That was, I think, one of the interesting things about Ichthus being run by uh, seminarians and college students from Asbury, that we looked at the groups, but we wanted to look beyond what they were playing to what they were saying. So that what was being communicated would be good and trustworthy teaching that you don't worry about what kids are going to take away from the festival. So that, no, that was one of the things we spent a lot of time during the year in talking through the different groups based on that very thing. And there were some that we said, no, we don't want them a part of what we're doing. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned the, the range of things. I'm looking at the roster for 1979, the year I was born, not to make you feel, you know, yeah. feel older. Yeah. Anything, but the year after you stopped working there. Um, and you had Daniel Amos in the mix. And Daniel Amos is one of those that doesn't really fit the mold because they're uh, kind of have like a satirical edge. And, you know, you kind of have to listen through, if you don't know what their deal is, a couple of times to figure out what it is they are trying to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're Another guy like that would be Steve Taylor, who springs up just a few years later and is very right. tongue in cheek in his style. And, yep. and you know, it's in some ways it's it's, uh, you know, almost like a satire on some of the things that are even going on within the Christian music scene. But there are a lot of theological themes. It's interesting, you know, with the Ichthus Festival that it springs up with Asbury Seminarians, because we're talking about Wesleyan Arminians. Right. And a lot of the juice that's driving some of this is coming out of reformed and Calvinist ideas. Right. Which is what people are arguing about 
till the wee hours of the night at, at Asbury Seminary. But there's also another thing that really is strong in this movement. And I wonder if you could speak to, to, to how it kind of manifested. And that is, um, you're at the end of the second millennium, and there is this very real sense that Jesus could be here any minute now. Uh, and we could all be raptured and actually debate within and among some of these bands as to how it was going to take place and how books like Daniel and Revelation should be interpreted. Um, I wonder if if you have any experience of those arguments about, you know, kind of how rapture talk um, really was a hallmark of this movement. Yeah, I think in the latter part of it, uh, in the earlier part, uh it was there, especially if you look at uh, Larry Norman, I Wish We'd All Been Ready, uh, was a theme song. And what's interesting is that even among Wesleyan Arminians and Calvinist Baptists, uh, there was almost this given that the rapture was something that everybody kind of assumed. It's, it's interesting how that one particular teaching kind of uh, took root in a variety of, of uh, different Protestant groups, even though it might not fit their essential uh, teachings and doctrines that, that they were founded upon, but it just kind of saturated our culture. And uh, at that time, yeah, I, I wish we'd all been ready. Uh, those kinds of, I can't wait to see Jesus, uh, Pat Terry group. Uh, there were a number of, of groups that were singing songs along that line, and there was that sense again, I think of we were, we didn't think it was going to last very long. Jesus was about ready to come. And, uh, we weren't that many years away from, uh, 88 reasons why Jesus was going to return in 1988, uh, and things like that. Um, uh, and then 89 reasons why he should return in 89. And I think, uh, I think wasn't gave up in, uh, 94, I think finally. But um, all of those, th those were just kind of a part of the, the Christian culture of the times. They, they really were. I was trying to find my, my copy. I've got Wisnant's book on my shelf somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, the 88 one, not the, not the 89 or the 94. I got the original. Um, but uh, so I think uh, when I'm thinking back to songs that kind of have that apocalyptic flair, I think probably my personal favorite one uh and one I actually used to cover when I would do solo acoustic shows is uh, Barry Maguire's Eve of Destruction. Oh, of uh, course. Of course, Barry yeah. was a, um, I think he was with, the, was it the New Christie Minstrels? I can't remember exactly who that he was That was just with after before. the New Christie Minstrels when he went out on his own and he did Eve of Destruction. And of course, later he had that wonderful conversion. Uh, I had a chance yeah. to spend some time with him about 15 years ago that was just absolutely electric. He was with- Oh man, uh, I'd love to pick that guy's brain. Oh yeah, he and Terry Talbot were doing a duo and they were awesome. Uh and uh so uh and he would do uh it was Talbot McGuire and he would do the Eve of Destruction but with a little bit different of course bent at that point. But uh yeah, he he was a, a living legend back in those days and that was of course a top 40 song. Yeah, it was. And it's got that great line um where he's you know, talking about all the horrible things that are going on in the world and all the horrible ways that we're treating one another. And then that line where he says, hate your next door neighbor, but don't forget don't to forget say to grace. Don't forget to say grace. And yeah, man, it's a it's a brutal line. Um, but yeah, I mean, th these are very raw, um, raw songs. But uh, I want to kind of get into your own spiritual journey connected to this, because mm -hmm. I think if people were to be in that world and talk to Randy Sly, 1977 ICTHU staff member, and you were to say, well, you know, 25 years from now, I'm going to be wearing a Roman collar as a Catholic priest, people would probably be stupefied and shocked. <laughs> but I wonder if there's anything that was in that world, um, some of those ideas about, you know, the imminence of Christ's return or and the debates going on there or the the um, the evangelistic pull or, or, or any of the conversations you were witnessing that that planted seeds or started conversations that that you would later think back upon as you were thinking toward the Catholic Church. I think the one thing that happened to me, and I, you know, of course, I, I got married during this time, uh, and all of the songs in our wedding were pretty much Jesus music uh, from that era, and uh, that was the world we lived in. And I would say that 
the one thing that kind of was lodged in my heart and in my wife's heart and Sandy's heart is the willingness to say yes to Jesus no matter what. Um, you know, there, there are so many songs, a, a lot of songs that were sung by youth group, uh, youth groups during that time. And that's one of the things I loved about that era is a lot of the music was, uh, able to be reproduced locally in your youth group. You could get a guitar, get a songbook, and you could be doing, you know, it only takes a spark or something like that. Um, but, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus. I think was, to me, more than just a song, but it was, it was a lifestyle, a commitment that no matter what would come next, uh, you know, I'm going to say yes to Jesus. I think the other thing that was happening in me, and this probably comes out of my background and growing up in the Episcopal Church, is I loved contemporary Christian music and I loved chant. I mean, uh, I could go into an Episcopal church at that time and just fall in love with what I heard and at the same time go out and, you know, uh, you know, kick out the jams. And both of them felt really comfortable to me. So there was always this part of me, this slice of my life that had that sense of desire for the transcendent. And even when I was at Asbury and when I entered into ministry in the Wesleyan Church, um, whenever I wanted to go and be alone with the Lord, I would go to either the Episcopal or the Catholic Church, and I would sit there in the stained glass nave and smell the incense, and there was something about that that just brought about us the transcendent nature of God. And uh, so... I think that that was kind of inbred within me. Uh, and, but the saying yes, I think was, was a key component at every step because there were a lot of yeses that I had to say along the way. And, uh, the other thing I think that happened to me back in, in the Jesus movement early days, everybody had a life verse. And that was kind of the verse that they would talk about whenever they gave their testimony or whatever. And it's interesting how you use that in conversation. Like I can remember being at a, a group called Way Seekers and this was an, you didn't, we didn't know where the guys, where everybody went to church. All we know is that we were together. We loved Jesus and we were studying the Bible and there'd be somewhere 60 or 70 kids in a living room just there eager to pray and study the scriptures. I mean, uh, youth ministry at that time was so easy. You just opened up a Bible. Uh, at our local church, we had a group of 40 kids that met for an hour before the church service started to pray that God would have his way in that service, that hearts would be turned and that people would come to Jesus. I mean, it was an amazing time. But I, I remember in those meetings, we'd say, oh, you know, that guy's a real Matthew 24. You know, he's denying himself, taking up his cross and following Jesus. Um my life verse was always, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And the whole thing of abiding in Jesus and allowing his resources to flow through me as a branch, that the fruit of his uh, goodness, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of that will come out of my life. So all of that, I think, com uh, were composites of everything that God was building into me that kind of led me, and I think, to a, wanting a balance. I, I love the imminent uh, nature of God that was being expressed and emphasized, but I longed also for the transcendent. Uh, I, I know uh, years ago, listening to another uh, person preaching who was about my same age, and he said when he entered his 40s, he kind of got to the point of going, is this all there is? You know, there's got to be more than just this. And I think that's where I went is I, I love this, but there's got to be more that needs to be added on. You know, it's funny, as you mentioned, your, you know, your life first being, you know, I am the vine, you were the branches, you know, remain in me, you'll bear much fruit is, uh, you know, kind of in a very direct and sacramental way connected to what you do now, right? Because being yeah. connected to Christ through the line of the apostles, you now 
you know, consecrate the fruit of the earth and the work of human hands, right, and build up the body of Christ as a Catholic priest in the sacraments. It's kind of an extraordinary Absolutely. thing uh, to reflect upon. But we, when we did our series on the 90s and 2000s Christian punk rock underground, uh, we did have to reflect. And I think um, because generationally we were, you know, a few decades removed from this, um, mm-hmm. a lot of things had kind of happened and a lot of things had kind of come to the fore that sort of had to be dealt with. And and one of them was that you can't just play in a Baptist church one night and a Church of Christ uh, fellowship the next night and a Presbyterian coffee house the next night and keep continuing to pretend forever that they're all the same. Right. You just can't. Uh, at a certain point, there there comes a tension, there comes a... And, and you would have to have known this because you're booking... Ichthus Festival stuff in the context of a Wesleyan seminary that there is that tension. I wonder if you felt that tension at all when you were in that world. I think we it was there definitely, and especially when um, uh, the founder of Ichthus was a theologian. You know, Doctor Lyon taught Latin. Uh, he taught uh, uh, you know uh, theology, and so he was a a, a brilliant theologian from the Wesleyan Arminian position. So I know that that had a, a certain bias uh, in terms of what we wanted to express uh, at the festival. I would say that it informed our speakers more than it informed our musicians. Uh, we were very careful about who spoke uh, and what they said, uh, as opposed to, uh, because musicians, for the most part, uh, they dealt with with doctrine in some ways, uh, but there were it, it there was a little bit of a, a flexibility there that you don't have when you're taking your Bible and you're teaching young people this is what God is saying to us today. So that was an area that we talked a lot about. There was a lot of discussion about who should speak, you know, and what should be communicated, and it also goes uh, to the idea of. What was the theme for that year? Uh, one of the things that people didn't really realize is that, in a sense, there was each year had somewhat of a theme. It wasn't overt, but it was somewhat different. Uh, I think it was 1970, was it 78 maybe that, uh, I can't remember, 77, 78, there was some intentionality in terms of the types of groups we chose that they wanted to make some moves toward some more substance in what was being communicated musically. And, uh, and that would change, I think, year to year, depending on who was the program director, who was the, uh, executive director of, uh, Ichthus and who was involved in the committee. Cause, uh, we had some very passionate discussions about all that. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, looking back at the Ichthus festival, uh, in my little yearbook, you know, when uh, the 96 festival came around and the 97 one, which is, I think, the, was the 97? The 96 might have been my first one. But we had, you know, like 20 bands, right? And then when I came on board, uh, we were uh, setting up our second stage and eventually the third stage. And I had kind of crafted the third stage as, well, the second stage is more of like a kind of like hard rock stage. And then the third stage is more of like an underground, you know, not yet heard of acts. Because at that point, anybody who's playing on the main stage is selling hundreds of thousands of records oh, <laughs> you yeah, know because right, the industry exactly. has kind of exploded at this point right but i i have kind of one more main question about this to you and it, and it kind of gets at that that question of the intentionality and the theology and the overlap and how can you hold all these different views together um when i was when i started going to ichthus in the mid 90s mid to late 90s uh on saturday afternoon between kind of the day acts and the evening main stage acts, there would be kind of a praise and worship service, and there would be communion distributed in um, in some form to the entire hillside full of people. And uh, in our world, it was, you know, kind of the plastic cup with like a little foil thing over top of it and the juice underneath. And then there was the wafer on top and then a saran wrap thing on top of it. And you could peel, get the cracker, peel, do the juice. Um, and I remember... Not really having a debate about transubstantiation up to that point or or necessarily feeling like I had some deep understanding of what communion was or should be, but just thinking as I'm going seeing them go around and 
picking up big industrial black trash bags full of these leftover things at the end of it that something something was pricked in my conscience about that <laughs> as it were right. i wonder was was communion a part of of your era of ichthus or was that something that was not ready to be touched or what was going on with that we were at the time that just started doing it and i think in fact uh it was one of my years i can't remember which one where somebody found a person that would do the cup with the wrap and the wafer and everything and all of that and that was our first uh, go around uh, at doing something like that. And I have to say that growing up in the Episcopal Church, there was something about that that I, that I chafed at, um, to dangle a preposition. And uh, this was even more prominent as I continued as a pastor. Uh, I was the uh, program director. I went on to be uh, in the Wesleyan Church, I went on to do the youth, big youth conventions and stuff, and I was the program director for uh, our International Wesleyan Youth Convention in uh, 70, uh, 76, I think it was. Uh, no, it wasn't either. It was 82, excuse me. And in 1982, we decided we would do communion with 12,000 students uh, in um, Champaign-Urbana at the Big Dome. And... So the committee got the idea, what we'll do is we'll use croutons and grapes. And you don't want to turn students loose with croutons and grapes in a domed arena where they can try to reach the other side with one of the grapes. It was a very sad, sad thing. And so I think, because again, because of my background, those types of things just uh, caused me, I think that drove me more and more toward wanting to find ways to bring the, the dynamics of communion as I remembered it as a, as a, as a child, as a young person into what I was doing later on. So yeah, I, I think I was up kind of the same boat you were in that respect. Yeah, and I was a long way, by the way, at that point, probably eight, ten years away from becoming Catholic. <laughs> right? Oh, I was many years um, more but, than that, it, yeah. Right. So, but again, this is an extraordinarily powerful uh, world of music, and um, I mean, it would go on in the '80s to kind of explode and um, become more kind of a formalized Christian radio, contemporary Christian scene. And Amy Grant, and Michael W. Smith, and Petra, and and those groups would start to make their mark. And then by the '90s, you've got you know, really just a full-fledged, uh, complete Christian music industry. Uh, but there are people who have, like, deep, informative memories of being in that world and seeing these musicians and, and going to these concerts. And um, I have I have kind of two more questions. And, and the second to last question is, is this, Father, and that is, what would you say to somebody who had such a deep and profound experience of Christianity in that world of Jesus music and hearing concerts and these evangelistic moments and, you know, where everybody is just like weeping and converting at the end of a concert. What would you say to someone who maybe has no idea or doesn't think that the Catholic Church has anything to offer who, to somebody who's got who's got that experience? Now that you're removed from it and, and you know, now obviously a Catholic priest, uh, what does the church have to offer to people who come from that world? I think that Again, uh, if we look at the church, the Catholic Church, Big C, being representative of the church in history, the church has room for everything in terms of music. You can have Gregorian chant as well as some of the contemporary. I think the Steubenville conferences have done a good job of showing how to incorporate beautiful praise and worship with adoration. When I came into the Catholic Church, I didn't have to jettison any of the what I had before. My love for contemporary Christian music, uh, you know, continues, and I believe it it can inherently still be a part of what uh, what we're doing. What's interesting when I was a president of a high school for uh, the last several years, and we took the students on retreat, and they started praise and worship music. A lot of times, it was the stuff from my generation that were still being played by them, you know, 
Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's some new ones like Ocean and others that they love. But, you know, it's some of that old stuff that uh, that still has mileage in terms of, again, helping the beating heart want to connect in with the Lord. At the same time, it 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 finds its way to uh, being a part of, of life that goes beyond that. And to me, my Catholic faith kind of completes what I what I desired to do back in those days, because, uh, again, with contemporary worship, you were raising your hands, you were pr- praising God, you were worshiping uh, and you just looked up. I mean, you didn't you could look at the band and and all of that was going on. But how beautiful it is when that is done in the context of Jesus being present in the Blessed Sacrament. And all of this is taking place, and you have a, a, a focal point of Jesus' manifest presence in our midst there in the monstrance. Or again, the altar in, uh, in, in our worship times, uh, just focusing on the altar during a Mass. Uh, and again, I think that, uh, to me, my Catholic faith allows me to have a more complete— I've got more tools in my tool belt uh, for worship— and uh, yet all of what I had back then, these treasuries uh, just can continue to live on. I still love listening to a lot of that old music. It's probably the white hair. You know, I like oldies on the radio, too. So, Well, and it's interesting, too, that uh, and, and you mentioned this and this, uh, I think, you know, kind of gets it at something else about, you know, as this all is exploding and, and trying to figure out what do we do with this music? Where do we put it? <laughs> you know, where is it? What's the most appropriate place to have it? Um, right. And you know, realizing uh, again in, in my world that what I was doing was never, ever going to be part of Sunday morning. And I wouldn't, this is long before I ever discovered the concept of liturgy. Um, but also, I, you know, thinking too about what's kind of resolved in the mass from a tension that was so often in place in that world, which is these artists saying, you know, don't look at me. I'm not here to draw attention to myself. I just want to point to Christ. And you know, this is something that even you see in in big church pulpits, and that I'm sure you wrestled with as a pastor. And the the way it gets resolved is by what you do when you say "Ecce Agnus Day," <laughs> right? You hold the host above your yeah. head and say, "Everybody, look up here, look at yeah. Christ." In some ways, that's the way the tension gets resolved. Of mm-hmm. you know, these people who want to share the gospel and want to point to Christ, but really all you're seeing is a guy up there in a cool shirt and a guitar. The tension is resolved when you hold up Christ truly present in the Eucharist and everybody's eyes are fixed up there. I mean, that's in some ways, that's kind of what you were hungry for in those moments. Mm-hmm. I know it's what I was hungry for uh, in those moments. Exactly, yeah. I think the one thing about music in the context of worship, especially like the Mass, is that if we if we think about music then, it needs to be music that is addressed to God. You know, as opposed to my experience, that especially as I'm coming to communion or doing the, that, that my whole attention has to be riveted on him. And I think that's one of the lessons I learned uh, early on from uh, uh, C.S. Lewis when I was on my journey toward liturgy, is that liturgy is an opportunity for us to really allow ourselves to focus completely on the God that is present rather than to be distracted by everything that's going on around us. And I think that's that's the key to liturgy. And even key to the music choices that are made at that time. Yeah, you had a great quote in your Journey Home episode, which I hope people go watch. Uh, and it, and it kind of gets at some of the question of, like, how does this contemporary music fit? Like, what is... What's just meant to be out there in the world to enjoy, or perhaps in, in a different context than the Mass, you know... Um, the Lewis quote, I wish I could remember, and it was uh, about Jesus saying, feed my sheep. It's going to drive me nuts. On my Hopefully rats. you remember it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't feed my... Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. Uh, Jesus said, she- feed my sheep, not experiment on my rats. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, Lewis on, on you know, right and wrong ways to approach how this stuff might work in liturgy. So... Yeah, exactly. Um, my last question for you, Father Randy Sly, before we let you go, I'm not going to ask you, and I didn't ask the other guys in the 90s and 2000s episode. 
Uh, I'm not going to ask you what the best concert was that you ever went to, but if you could name one just extraordinarily memorable concert um, where you just, it is just stuck in your brain and you remember everything about that particular show, uh, what would be one of those shows? Yikes. I mean, I've I've been to so many and been a part of so much in that. Um, I think that one one little portion of uh, the, I, I think it would be at Ichthus the year that Ken Miedema was there, and um, here is a solo blind pianist and singer on stage at Ichthus, and he's singing the song about Moses. Moses in the wilderness and all of that. And it's just him and his piano and thousands of, of young people just riveted on that moment. And you could tell that it, and, and Ken Miedema was not what you would call a huge star, but an amazing communicator musically. And that moment of just listening to what he was sharing and it just took you into the scriptures and into that moment, you know. And then at the end, you know, what do you, the challenge to the people was, what do you have in your hand? He's talking about Moses having the rod of Moses became the rod of God. You know, what have you, what do you have in your hand? And just listening to him sing that over the crowd was, uh, just electric at that moment. So that, that was one of the, one of the big things. Uh, I would have to hitchhike that with one other thing that for me, uh, we had a, uh, we would bring all, everybody into Ichthus a day early and we would pay for an extra day of their time so they could rest. And they loved that. They could uh, just hang around the campus. Uh, they could play tennis, whatever. And then we had a, a, a common meal with all of the artists together and just sharing with them. And, just to see how real and they were was just a blessing. You know, these were real, honest, Jesus loving people. And I, you know, there are stories about groups and stuff, but, uh, I loved hanging around them, recognizing the fact, yes, they were, they had amazing talents, but in many ways they were, uh, just followers of Jesus. They were disciples using the gifts God had given them and wanting to just make it happen. It was it was wonderful. Well, very cool. Well, I hope we've given people uh, who weren't part of that world a window into it. And I hope that for the people who remember this stuff like it was last week, um, it's been an, a neat opportunity to kind of enter back into that world. For me, you know, I didn't experience any of this stuff until probably the mid 80s was the first time I really became kind of cognizant of it. But it very quickly became clear to me how indebted I was to it. And how the whole world that I was growing up, especially the songs that I was singing every Sunday morning, it was either Bill Gaither or this stuff, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. That was kind of what I was singing every Sunday morning. Uh, and then Sunday night, we do the hymn sings of the old Charles Wesley stuff. But it's just incredible, the the lasting impact of, of some of this music. And I bet you, uh, you'd be surprised if you were to go through even a Catholic hymnal or two and find some of the songs written by some of these Absolutely. people. Absolutely, um, yeah. So. Even the St. Michael's hymnal, well, which is one of the more oh. conservative ones. One one other quick thing that I think is really cool that was oh, kind please. of a, a neat um, uh, kind of cycling around. The group that basically was a part of, of my encounter with the Lord, the certain sounds from First Baptist Church, Van Nuys, California, the pastor of the church was Harold Fickett. And uh, I am indebted to him in, in so many ways. He had such a marvelous, marvelous ministry with the people. Well, uh, probably about 10, 12 years ago, I happened to notice that on the Catholic Exchange that the editor was Harold Fickett. So I, I was contacted about to ask him. if it was the same Harold Fickett. It was his yeah. son. Oh, my it goodness. Was, it was the son of the pastor. And he said, I remember that year vividly. He said, I was in the youth group at that time. I remember that year and, and what happened with the certain sounds. And it was so cool because he had done the same thing I had in terms of discovering the fullness of the Catholic faith. He works for, uh, Alatea now, 
But it was really fun because we could compare notes of, of a journey that started from a, a common framework of the same people that uh, brought me to a new level of encounter with the Lord and uh, and his dad. And being able to speak of, you know, not just the limitations of, of that scene, because they were many and there were, you know, things that were fraught and theological, you know, fisticuffs and, and all that, but it, it formed so many people. It started people, uh, so many of them, on a journey to Christ, and, and many of them, like yourself, have ended up in the in the Catholic Church. I, I meet people every month at the Coming Home Network who have some kind of formative experience from that world. So Right, exactly. All right. Well, Father Sly, I could probably talk about two more hours about this stuff, but uh, we'll cut it here. Uh, and I really want to see what people's comments are because I'm sure there's some people who have uh, experiences connected with this this very this very kind of thing. I very much encourage people, by the way, to go see Father Sly's Journey Home episode, um, where he goes into kind of more the narrative arc of his journey and kind of completes the story and fills in a lot of blanks that we couldn't get to here. Uh, so chnetwork.org if you want to do that. Uh, you can go to community.chnetwork.org if you would like to plug into our online community, and then of course if you want to support what we do chnetwork.org slash donate father slide thank you again uh this has hey, been an you, absolute this joy been and i had a lot of fun me too thanks so much right, for the invite hey you bet and thank you for listening to this episode of ch network presents we'll talk to you again soon